we have given you much more time for this conversation, uh, you would still have plenty to talk about. Uh, I can tell you that uh, we, on our hand, uh, had a fantastic exchange uh, about the issue of class, identity, uh, nature of progressive politics, and what to do about contemporary capitalism, <laughs> and all that in five minutes. Uh, now, I'm certain that your conversation even surpassed us, surpassed us in terms of uh, excitement. And I am told that there are two microphones, and I see one and I see the other. Now, we are very attached to our microphones, uh, so the comrades holding microphones will be holding the microphones. It's the holding of power. Um, but I'd like to hear some insights or maybe questions. I'll take a couple and come back to the panel, and then I'll come back to the audience. So who'd like to go first and tell us something about the experience from the table? I see a lot of volunteers. Uh, you don't need to be shy. Nobody volunteers. We'll just pick somebody. <laughs> OK, that's a steered democracy. Uh, yes, here we have. Uh, thank you so much for breaking the ice. Well, one of the things that uh, we talked about is, is this issue that came up with Ken Newman this morning, uh, the difference between tackling the symptoms of the moment and the root causes. And I thought his point was extremely well made because it seemed as though we were moving into this direction, you know, that we have to uh, subsidize consumption uh, and, and those kinds of things. Uh, my issue is electoral reform. I'm the president of Fair Vote Canada. Thank you. One of the things I noticed is we're not talking about it at this summit. That preoccupies me extremely. Um, that is one of our root causes. That is a problem we need to, need to deal with in this country. If people go to the polls and their vote doesn't count for anything, which applies to the majority of voters, by the way, uh, I think we're going to continue having problems. So I just wanted to put that on the table as a root issue that needs to be addressed. And I greatly hope that the NDP is going to have that on the table going into the next election as a priority issue. Thank you very much. I have a hand, uh, the gentleman just behind. When we're talking about uh, social justice issues and, and uh, activities, uh, my sector is education. And I look at the, the rationale for education as a political plank. According to the United Nations, it's a universal right, not a political plank or just simply a budget item. And when children's uh, future is affected because we're talking about education simply as a, a budgeted item and how we can deliver public education on a dime, I think that's a travesty. So what we need to be able to do is separate the politics from universal rights. And when we're talking about the future of the country, that's every child in Canada. So I'd like, that's one of the areas that uh, we would like to see more action being taken on, uh, having education at the forefront, not simply a, a political basketball that can be bounced around. Thank you. Alongside the spirit, I'm moving to the left. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yes, please. Excellent. Uh, Ilya, I was reminded uh, as you were speaking that my first experience of public activism was getting on a bus from Montreal and coming to Parliament Hill to join in the protests to free Soviet Jews at the age of 12. Um, I, the next thing I remember might have been writing an anti-monarchist letter to the Montreal Star at age 14. <laughs> And then getting involved in um, supporting uh, Dr. Morgenthaler's efforts and women's efforts to have rights to abortions in Quebec. Um, and, and, and now here I am in 2019, and I'm, I lead a religious community. I'm a rabbi, and I'm looking at the empty space in this room where questions of progressive faith have not been put on the table. And, and I just want to invite everybody here to see how that's another place where, as Ilya said, conversation needs to happen, awareness needs to grow, and that, that movement from a political party to streets to institutions has to include those institutions as well. Thank you. 
Do I see another hand? Yes, please. The lady with the blue scarf. Okay. Um, I'm here because I'm extremely concerned about the threat of climate change and what that uh, is going to mean to people who are young now in their lifetimes. By the time that they're my age, I'm 67, what is this world going to look like? We, we have to take it very seriously that emissions are still rising. Um, we haven't even leveled off, let alone gone down fossil fuel emissions, even though renewable energy is starting to, to come forward. But we, if we need a vision. People are more and more concerned about climate change, and that's in recent Abacus poll as well. And we need to address that with a vision and a program like the Green New Deal in the United States that brings together the economy and the environment and a sustainable future. So really would like to hear much more about that. Thank you very much. I can take uh, one more, one, two more, I see, uh, three more actually. And uh, you know, that's the end of my bargain. Uh, so I'll take one from the left and the two here. Yeah, yeah, yes, please. Hi, so my name is Milana Roberts and I'm a project manager with the Power Lab. And um, I'm also here with Food Secure Canada. And we had a really great conversation. So I'm not necessarily sharing where I'm coming from, but the things that we talked about that really spoke to this theme of matching the movement to the moment. So in conversation earlier, there was this idea that we often come together in these circles. You know, we talked about there's, there's the largest progress summit in the last five years. And the reason being is, you know, there's a lot of fear that often motivates people into these spaces. And we talked about the idea that um, coming from fear can be a momentary driver, but isn't something that's going to last, isn't something that's long term. And so how can we think about creating spaces of hope, creating spaces that imagine this? Um, you talked about the idea of building, you know, new imaginaries for the front lines. And I think that that's a really powerful um, place to come from. And I would really encourage us all in all of these challenging topics that we're dealing with to think about what, what are those imaginaries and really thinking about what can we build together versus not always what we're trying to get away from or, or, or crash, crush. Um, we also talked about the idea in our group. It was like, where do we start? How do we tackle this idea? And um, I really looked to the work that we're doing at the Power Lab. And actually, that was very much inspired by Charlene and questions she asked in her work. Um, so we really talked. Yeah, you can give her a round of applause. <laughs> Um, and it was really about this idea that we often come to in food work as well, about being really relational. So who are we? You know, we're all coming here from such different experiences and centering who we are and building relationships with each other, I think is the best way to think about matching the movement to the moment because this moment is very much who we are and what, what we're all experiencing. And I think she asked a couple of questions that I would also encourage you throughout your time here to ask yourself. Simply, who you are, um, who are your people? Who are the people that you're doing work for, that you're thinking about, you know, um, what are you fighting for? What are the things that you feel really passionate about that are driving you in your every day and, and really defining that? And then how will you, you know, do that work? And I think asking yourself those relational questions is, is really the key to answering these questions and allowing us all to move in the same direction. And I, I think the last thing, um, we talked about, and it was quite illustrative of one of the people in our conversation, is the idea is sometimes the place that you're in isn't the easiest place to answer those questions. You might not find the people to be in relation with who are also working on the same issues you are, who, who are coming from um, experiences you recognize. And we talked about sometimes it's easier to see those things when you're outside of that space, when you're you know, taught, whether it's you traveling somewhere else and you're really understanding your own context. And so I really want to thank all the diverse perspectives that are here to allow us to really understand this context. Thank you so much. And I promised to hear, and that's absolutely it, I'm afraid. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I actually want to address the matching the movement to the movement because I believe we're all part of a movement, and a movement that's uh, committed to dealing with anti-racism. Uh, try to make sure that our societies are truly inclusive. Um, but my question to the panel is, um, and, and talking personally as someone who is a community organizer and activist and who's committed to this work, actually co-founded the Coalition Against White Supremacy and Islamophobia. Uh, so my question is to you folks about what we can do to make sure that governments are with us, right? Like that our, you know, 
the institutions that we've created in our society work for us. So for example, when you have uh, President, I don't want to mention his name, you know, talk about you know, white nationalists, white supremacists as, uh, as if they are the same as anyone else. There's two sides to every story. It's almost like this, it's, it's almost like governments taking a policy of neutrality, right? Like, we'll let you folks fight it out, but you know, no matter who dies, no matter whose human rights are violated, it doesn't matter as long as you vote for us, right? And I think that's very problematic. So in the wake of New Zealand and what happened in New Zealand, it exposed a failure of our institutions, our intelligence community, our law enforcement, for taking this threat really seriously, which is the rise of white supremacy and white nationalism. And it's having an impact in how we live uh, and how we work and how we, how we actually function in our society. So if you could elaborate on that, on how to make sure our institutions work for us, I'll appreciate that. Thank you. OK, thank you. And I have had one more here in the front table, yeah. <laughs> this is the very last one. Uh, I wanted to say thank you to my uh, uh, rabbi sister. Uh, I'm also a person of the faith community. I'm a United Church minister, retired. Uh, what, what I find missing in a lot of our conversations, uh, both in the political parties but also uh, so far here, is that we talk about issues, but we don't talk about vision. And, and I, I think it, uh, our issues need to in be informed by a larger vision. The old CCF uh, was informed by the New Jerusalem vision, and uh, that's not a vision that would be appropriate for today. But I don't have a sense that we somehow have described or tried to describe what kind of a culture, society, globe we, are, we really want to live in. And we keep talking about particular issues, but we don't have that sense of the, 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 the whole. And that's... Uh, Maybe that's a faith-based problem that we t talk more about the whole than we do about the issues, but I don't think so. <laughs> right. I'm uh, already uh, running uh, almost uh, uh, at the level of being banned from the summit for uh, mismanagement in terms of uh, uh, conversation. And we have profound issues because I have heard the questions about representative democracy uh, and the question of governing, the question about uh, rights uh, and standards, the acceptance and the issue of progressive approach to fate, um, the issue of how we battle fear with enough uh, uh, degree of hope, and last but not least, what actually is our vision of the better world? Now, um, you are free to choose one aspect that you want to refer to. So yes, we are going to be the ones not delivering to the full satisfaction because of time constraints. Um, but you know, some you know, inspirational last thoughts about uh, one of the questions. Boschka, est-ce que tu peux commencer? Oui, c'est la surprise. Um, so I have to, to pick one of, of the... Oui, uh, the je suis aussi à une chaise parce que uh, ouais. nous sommes très Mais limités. Tout à l'heure, tu nous as demandé de finir sur uh, quelque chose qui nous a semblé être une, un succès. Oui, ça c'était Donc je vais faire pire, un lien. Ouais. Um, je, je, je pense que dans les, dans les dernières années, je vais parler du Québec, par exemple. Euh, on a souvent été, euh, quand je dis « on », c'est euh, certaines catégories de la, de la population et donc euh, parmi eux les musulmans. On a souvent été euh, mis sous les projecteurs euh, des, des médias et des, et des acteurs politiques. Et donc là, je répondrai à deux personnes. C'est-à-dire que la question du religieux, elle n'est pas absente. Elle est euh, gérée par contre de façon très, euh, très maladroite euh, et elle tend à discriminer un certain nombre euh, de, de, de citoyens. Et je veux faire un lien avec ta question. Nous avons des succès et nous avons des façons de participer. Euh, et, et, et par exemple, je, je souhaite le mentionner, j'ai travaillé dans la dernière campagne euh, euh, ici au Québec avec une candidate qui était présentée comme la première candidate voilée. Um, so you know what I'm, I'm talking about. And, um, et personne ne, ne considérait quand même le fait qu'elle était quelqu'un de gauche, euh, qu'elle avait euh, des, 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 comment dire, une, une, un souci euh, des enjeux d'inéquité et d'une représentation de toutes et tous qui primait d'abord sur le fait qu'elle qu portait le voile, qui était une de ses façons et une de ses appartenances. Donc ce que j'ai quelque part envie de dire, c'est qu'il euh, y a une façon de nous impliquer euh, en assumant la multiplicité des appartenances et la multiplicité des identités qui nous, qui nous, qui nous ramènent. Et ça, ça fait la force et la solidarité entre les, 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 les groupes que nous espérons et que, et que nous appelons les nôtres. 
Shalin. Yeah. I was doing some research while you were talking, <laughs> make sure <laughs> I had my facts straight. So first, I heard someone invoke the Green New Deal. I'll just say this, stop uh, even just looking to the United States for solutions to problems around the world. I'm just gonna say that. We are not the model for all things liberation. Uh, Canada, someone said earlier, has not ever had a new deal. So what is the new deal for Canada? You all should be fighting for something that makes sense here, geographically, right, and historically. So I'm going to say that part. No, you just said one thing, but I had to put that out there. Um, oh, fine. I'm in trouble anyway. <laughs> okay. So uh, what can we do to make sure that our governments are with us? In, in the comment uh, that, that you shared, uh, as a black person uh, who is technically a citizen in the United States of America, our government is fundamentally not set up to be with me or us. So that's not the struggle that I'm looking to engage in, is to figure out how it can just work for me. What I'm interested in doing in long term is how does my work contribute to long term work to transform how we govern in the place that I live, right? Because governance and government are not the same things. They overlap for sure, but our, our folks are, are, are deeply out of practice by, by, do, as a result of violence, force, capitalism, meaning you have to work 20,000 jobs, all these things out of practice of governance, right? Self-governance is, a, is a, an abstract concept for many people who have to work 60, 70 hours a week and still are, are scratching to survive with their families. So I'm really committed to thinking about that and actually deeply, deeply concerned when we only think that our ability to have our vote counted is the root problem. I'm curious about who's not having their vote counted. And, and the person who shared that, why aren't, who's not having their vote counted and why is that not happening? That's actually the root cause. The issue of not being, like the issue of voting rights is an issue, something that we want. An issue is the thing that we're fighting for. The problem is voter suppression. And the root cause of that voter suppression is, of course, based on context. In the US, we're talking about racism, uh, anti-black racism in particular. We're talking about patriarchy, when people's gender markers don't line up with what's on their IDs, all those things. So we have to get really real about the root causes to the problems that our people face. It is simply not an issue of representation in our government. We have representation. It's fundamentally, a pro in, many, in many cases, we have representation. It's fundamentally a problem of how power is exercised, who's able to have power, and who's not able to have power. And when people in power make choices, what are the choices that they're making? And the people who don't have the power that we need, what is our vision for collective liberation, one where we are in right relationship with each other and the land that we live on? That's what I'm interested in, in short. That's my vision. That's my vision, and it goes beyond who's elected. And so that then governs the way I do my organizing work, where I'm not just fighting for reforms that put a Band-Aid on it, but even if it's a reform, it gets us closer to where we want to get by transforming power dynamics. So that's, that's the work that gets me excited and wakes me up in the morning, where it's a part of a long arc strategy and not something that's like we know in our regular lives, that chocolate might taste really good right now. <laughs> but you know you ain't supposed to have chocolate because you're allergic to it. And so <laughs> think about what are the things that are going to make us, that are going to get us closer to, to fullness and wholeness. Ilya, over to you. Um, there's a note that says needs to wrap up very soon. Um, <laughs> So I'll just say uh, one source of optimism is that these moments of crisis, of uncertainty, are also have the potential to be tipping points to open tremendous opportunity. Um, so for all that, the question of how do you make government work for us, I think the short answer is you beat them and you replace them. And you don't just replace them with another political party, you replace them with people who share your vision of the world, your vision of politics. And I'll just close with a quick thing from the US, though the US political context is very different, so it, it's actually, you'd have to figure out your own way of doing it here, which is these last elections in 2018, Democrats won the House of Representatives. They pulled the emergency break on some of Trump's policies. That was important. It was essential to stop some of the acute attacks. But at the same time, we also saw the emergence of four extraordinary candidates who moved the ball in tremendously further down the field. 
uh, the first two Muslim women ever elected to Congress, who ran on tremendously progressive intersectional platforms on everything from healthcare to student debt to reparations to a re rethink of our policy towards Israel and Palestine. Two, at the same time, one of the highest profile wins was a primary win in New York City by a woman named Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez through her one win in one primary election, in one city, in one part of New York City, put the Green New Deal on the map, transformed the entire dialogue about climate in the United States. And what I think it speaks to is the fact that for all of the ways these are systemic structural challenges, the truth is one voice or one action or one protest lodged in the right moment, leveraged in just the right way, can fundamentally transform the opportunity space. And that's incredibly exciting for all the folks in this room and should be a call to action for all of us to fight for the things we believe in. Thank you. Thank you so much. I think it has been an absolutely exciting panel because when we talked about the moment, I think that we realized that we need a different kind of quality of politics. I think it's very clear that we need a different framework and I think it couldn't have been more bold that we sort of are happy with certain comfortable truths and we need to go beyond that. As also that we need to look at the causes that actually gear people like yourselves and those industries to get on going. And I think, you know, we might be talking that this is a very hard moment and we've talked a lot about fear and desperation and so on. But, you know, these might be the hardest time, but this will be ultimately the only times we will ever know to make them a better times. So I would say that, you know, I have asked the panelists and we don't have time for that to think about the next benchmark of success. And this is what I would like to think, to ask each and every one of you to think, what is the next benchmark of success of your activity in your different communities and reality? And what I'm taking are the three lessons, and with that I will wrap up. Number one, yes, these are extremely complex times, but the only proper answer will come from integrity that comes from the values that are deep in our hearts. Yes, I think those are the times, and some people were saying social media, post-truth, and manipulation of the truth, and we were talking about the newspaper. That's true, but being authentic cannot be manipulated, and I think that that should be our answer as progressives. And last but not least, I think when we are having all these conversations and we're using different expression and going for different semantic solutions to our problems, I think the most important thing to remember is to have a courage to stand up every single day, to have a courage to face the challenges, but also have a courage to dare to think about the better future. And with that note, I'd like to thank you very much for making this panel such a wonderful success. Thank you. Merci beaucoup à tous les